Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duart. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Success Thursday this week with Armin Mandara. Hey, Armin. Welcome to the show. Hey, Vasco. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. So we'll talk about success in a minute. But first, share with us, what's your favorite retrospective format and why? So when it comes to facilitating retrospectives, I'm pretty much following the very popular framework uh, laid out by Esther Derby and Diana Larson in their book, Agile Retrospectives. So it's uh, the five steps uh, that you go through. So you set the stage uh, of the retrospective. Here, I like to get, I like to do some exercise to get some generic um, impression of the retrospective from the team. Like, what what would be the song title of this sprint? Or if this sprint was a movie, how would you call it? Um, or the sprint in three words. So some generic uh, impressions uh, about the sprint. Next step would be to gather data. And we know these, um, these templates like Glad, Sad, Mad, what pushes you forward, what pulls you back. So having some form of exercise to identify what's going well and what's not going well. And for the next step where you want to generate insights, what I like to do is to have open conversations. Um, it's always a bit of a struggle between having a precise structure in a retro, but also to leave enough space for conversation. So I typically just don't do an exercise for this, but give here to give here space to actually discuss in a more deeper way what we have identified before. So we we talk about root causes, we talk about what the issues were. Um, so that we are prepared for the next step, decide what to do, which to me is uh, probably the most important step here, because if you just gather to complain and to talk about things that are <clears throat> not working well, but don't do anything out of it, it was not a big help. So I'm very much focused on generating high quality action items and deciding on what we are actually going to do with this. And here I always ask to define what do we do, who does it, and until when. So a very simple format to keep in mind for action items. Who does what until when? And eventually then when we have identified that you close the retrospective. Here I, um, I like to do also a very simple closing exercise like one message to the team. Or I remember one time during Christmas, I did as a closing, a wish to Santa Claus uh, that you want to share. So, so some fun and engaging way to close the retro. And you see in that way, I like to keep things simple and clear. With retros, you can get very fancy and some of my colleagues they are actually way more creative than i am with this they do dungeons and dragons retros they do mario kart retros and very creative things that the teams really enjoy um i like to stick uh, to the basics in that way and really focus on the discussion and uh, I'm, I'm just worried that such a setup might distract too much from our conversations and from our action items but the teams love these kind of more creative uh, retros. Um, and again, uh, we have awesome scrum masters uh, who, are, who are getting quite fancy. And it's also quite good to uh, vary, like uh, just uh, rotate the scrum masters and uh, do different uh, teams for each scrum master next time, because it also helps to bring the, the diversity, the novelty. Novelty also triggers uh, more awareness in the people in the retro. So why not just uh, mix it up and, mm. and get somebody else to facilitate your retro while you facilitate theirs? That's also a possibility. Absolutely. Or asking one of the team members. Um, I did that also um, where one of the developers was facilitating the ret retro and I was a participant. So that was fun. Um, so yeah, you can you can get very creative and fancy with these setups and, and 
making sure that there is some novelty is definitely a good idea to to trigger new thought processes to avoid that things are just uh, you want to avoid that you just go through the motions. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And, That's a and good way. Changing to do some it. things up is definitely helpful. And especially we want to avoid that going through the motions anti-pattern because we want our teams to succeed. And of course, we want ourselves to succeed. So let's talk about that now, Armin. Um, when you think about Scrum Master success, what comes to mind? Mm -hmm. So I, I really like that. Uh, question because it it allows for a deeper conversation about the value that we scrum master can bring and i if if people ask me what is the responsibility of a scrum master i like to summarize it in one simple sentence um, a scrum master's responsibility is to deliver a high performing team so making sure that the team you're working with delivers what they need to deliver um, in a valuable and and working way, and that being said, for me the most crucial way to assess the success of a scrum master is to check: Do we deliver valuable and working software on a regular basis? Typically, that means a couple of weeks. Um, and do we have fun while doing so? So I think this is the most important way of assessing if the team is actually doing a great job, they are delivering great products, um, they are delivering value to the clients, um, it's working software, so it's developed, it's tested and deployed. Um, and also, is there some, some, some sense of fun? Is, do people engage with each other? Is there some sense of ease uh, within the team? So that I would say um, is the most important factor. Do we actually manage to do our job as a team and deliver working valuable so software? Well, I, I want to dive into this sense of fun a little bit more because as you say, it, it seems quite obvious, but of course the devil is in the details as they say. So for yourself, Armin, when we're looking at it, when you are looking at a team and kind of asking yourself, you know, is this team having fun? Are they having this sense of fun that you mentioned? What are you looking for? Well, when it comes to how can it be observed, I think it's quite straightforward. Is there laughter? Is there some easiness in communication? Are there some jokes uh, being thrown? So um, I think we we all have certain images that that pop up in our mind when they think about fun. It's gathering with your team, gathering with your colleagues, having a good time while doing a work and of course we it it shouldn't stop us from having also difficult conversation um uh, in that sense but i believe that having fun together shows that um, people are comfortable with each other and this is a prerequisite for also having more difficult conversation for talking about how we work, how we can improve, what our issues are. Um, so, and of course, we all spend a significant amount of time at our work. It's typically at least 40 hours a week. So hopefully this is a time that we don't dread, uh, but more rather a time that we enjoy. Um, and especially that we are surrounded with people that we want to be surrounded with. And I think fun um, is a good facilitator of, of such an environment. And this is an incredibly important point. Uh, we were talking about how sometimes we hide our emotions and we try to keep things easy and harmonious. We were talking about that yesterday. Uh, um, uh, sorry, on uh, Tuesday when we talked about the Radical Honesty book. But... The point is also that when we have fun, we have healing of the potential conflicts. And when we don't have fun, there is no healing. 
So the conflicts just grow and grow and grow. And no wonder people want to avoid conflicts, right? But when the fun is there, it provides the space for us to feel that, hey, this was just a difficult conversation, but we're still having fun together. This is still a good environment for me. I don't need to hide the frustration or disappointment that I might be feeling at this point. And that's actually a very key point that you mentioned uh, uh, when it comes for us as Scrum Masters to help teams become high performing. Definitely having some level of fun needs to be part of the equation. Absolutely. And what you just mentioned brings me to the next success factor that I would mention uh, for success uh, for Scrum Masters, which is, do we actually talk openly and honestly about our problems? Uh, because I think it's quite obvious that wherever we work, problems will occur, especially in complex, if we move in complex environments. So the ability to talk about the problems that we are facing in an honest mad manner gives us also the ability to improve over time and to get better as a team to deliver better results. So that would be the other dimension I, want, I would like to mention. Do we talk openly and honestly about the problems that we're facing? And uh, absolutely. And everybody check out the Tuesday episode because there's a, a beautiful story as well as a book that can help with that. So check it out. Thank you for sharing that, Armin. Thank you, Vasco. Part of a successful Scrum Master job is to help the product owner. Tomorrow we explore that critical role in Scrum, the product owner role. Tune in to learn about product owner anti-patterns, what you can do to help the product owner, and a real-life example of what a great product owner is and what made it so. Tomorrow on our Friday product owner episode. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.